In the name of Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Fellow believers, 100 to 200 million dollars a year. That's my salary. Of course not. It is though what scientists and governments are spending to find out whether or not there is extraterrestrial life out there. Up to $200 million, do you think that's money well spent? Or are there needs closer to home that that money could be spent on affordable housing, cancer research? Why are people so interested in whether or not there are aliens? I think it's because people want confirmation that we are not alone. And if we could find this extraterrestrial life, and if it was intelligent life, that they had technology that we don't have, well, we would benefit. I have news for people like that and news for you this morning. It's actually a message from Mars. Not the planet Mars, of course, but Mars Hill, a rocky outcropping in the ancient city of Athens, from which the Apostle Paul preached the sermon 2,000 years ago. A sermon in which he said to his audience, God is near you. And a sermon in which the Apostle Paul says to us, God is revealed through you. Listen to the words of our text as they recorded in Acts chapter 17. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So far, God's word. The Apostle Paul ended up in Athens after being chased out of the cities of Thessalonica and then Berea. This seemed to be an unplanned stop. And Paul now had some time to kill as he waited for his co-workers, Timothy and Silas, to catch up with him. And so like anyone who was in Athens, he made a tour of the city. And what Paul noticed were temples everywhere, idols on every street corner, it seemed like, especially in the marketplace. And he found one idol that was of particular interest. It was labeled like this, to an unknown God. And Paul thought, here is my inn. Here is my springboard to reach out to these Athenians. And he said, I'm going to proclaim to you this God that you don't know. This God isn't far from you. In fact, he is very near you. Would that make you afraid? Or happy to learn for the first time, perhaps, that God is near you? 
If you're climbing Mount Humphreys for the first time and you don't know exactly where the summit is, you know how it is you get up to the saddle and you think, I'm so close to the top and you've probably got another hour and a half. If climbers who are on the way down say to you, oh, you're near the summit, it's good news, but it's also bad news because it means you're not there yet. Keep hiking. The people of Athens were very religious. They had multiple gods that they worshipped, impressive temples that they built, which you can still go visit today, the Parthenon on the Acropolis. There's always that picture you see of Athens today. And yet they were not as close to God as they thought. The problem was the Athenians thought that they could control God. They could put him in a box, in a house, and manipulate him if they just brought the right animal sacrifice. Paul wanted the Athenians to know that they had it backwards. It is God who is in control. Paul said of this God, he determined the time set for people and the exact places where they should live. Think back to when you moved into the house where you're living now. What is it? Was that a big decision that you had to make? Why that house and not another one? Why this city and not another city? There were many factors that went into making that decision. But Paul gives us the behind the scenes, the one who determined where you would live, not just Arizona, not just northern Arizona, not just Flagstaff and the areas or down in the valley, but right down to the street name and to the house number. God determined this, as Paul explained, so that all would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. The true God does not play hide-and-seek with humanity. If that's the case, though, then why do so many people seem to have a problem finding this God? Paul gives us a clue in an interesting Greek verb that he used. When he talked about people reaching out, it's the same verb you would use of describing a blind man walking into a room he's never been before. One hand reaches out so that he doesn't run into the wall. The other hand is tap-tapping away with his cane so that he avoids any other obstacles. From the moment that we are conceived, the moment that we come into this world, we are spiritually blind like that. One hand out, reaching, grasping, looking for God, but we're not really sure where he is. And so we do the best that we can. We look at nature and we realize that God must be immensely powerful to have created the universe. We look at our bodies and realize that God must be infinitely wise to have created everything, all our veins, capillaries, arteries to fit in the right order. We listen to our conscience and we realize God must have a sense of right and wrong, and he's going to punish me when I do what is wrong. But that's still limited knowledge. That would cause you to go and build a temple somewhere and to erect an idol and to bring an animal sacrifice to it. And it would fall short of what we really need to know about God. Paul pointed this out when he said to the Athenians, in the past God overlooked such ignorance of worshiping idols, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. Can you imagine the Athenians listening to Paul share this with them? These are the people of Athens, the people of Plato and Socrates. They had mastered building complex temples. They had come up with the idea of government and civil justice that many nations in the West still follow today. And here was Paul, 
this non-Greek coming in and saying to them, I know outwardly you seem like pretty good people, but what seems good to you is ignorance. And it's a sin for which you need to repent. Brothers and sisters, what are the things in our lives that seem good but might be pulling us away from the one true God? Maybe it's work. Work is good. God wants you to throw yourself into that work. But it's easy, isn't it? To use that as an excuse as to why you can't fulfill your other callings as spouse or parent, or turn that around. Being a good parent, being a good spouse is important, but can we not also use that as an excuse not to be faithful in the workplace? Saving for retirement. That's good, unless we are relying on that and our plan to see us through to the very end so that we are cutting God out and we are not being first fruits givers in our offerings, having hobbies and friends, those things are good. But are they helping you in your walk with Jesus or are they pulling you away from him? You see, Paul did not apologize for saying what he did because he was convinced of what Jesus had said in our gospel lesson last week. I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Kyle read the continuation of that John 14 passage, and we also heard Jesus say this today, if you love me, keep my commands. Paul has said there's a day of judgment coming, and the one to judge is the one appointed by God, and that judge is Jesus. Jesus, who says, if you love me, keep my commands. Okay, Jesus, well, none of us can do that. So what's plan B? Well, there is no plan B. There was and is only plan A, and that was a Savior. God knew from eternity that we, as mankind, would fall into sin, and yet he appointed his Son to be our substitute, to take the punishment for that sin. But don't think that this means we can just live any way that we want to. If you love me, keep my commands. If Jesus had offered forgiveness, so it didn't really matter what the Athenians had built, who they worshipped, what kind of idols they made up in their minds, the Apostle Paul would have said, men and women of Athens, you have acted in ignorance, but don't worry about it. Jesus paid for your sin. Just keep doing what you're doing. He said, repent. Friends, what are the sinful actions and attitudes that we have adopted thinking, well, I have forgiveness, right? We will want to turn away from that path of forgiveness as much as a hiker would turn away from a path playing with rattlesnakes. God is near you. It's a warning. Judgment is coming. But it's also a word of comfort, isn't it? God, in the person of Jesus, is near you. He is with you. He covers those sins. The Apostle Paul not only had something to say to the Athenians that day, he also speaks to us 2,000 years later. He reminds us, believers, God is revealed through you. You see, if it's true, and it is, that we can't find God on our own, that we can reach out for him, but we remain blind, then someone else needs to tell us about Jesus. 
That's the wonderful privilege that God has given to each one of us. And there's something we can learn about sharing our faith from Paul's experience in Athens. The first thing to note is this, that Athens was an unplanned stop for Paul. And yet he made the most of the opportunity. How often do you get up in the morning and say, today I'm going to witness my faith. I suppose it's something we should all be saying every morning. And yet we are in our scheduled task that we need to accomplish. And then before you know it, you're standing by the water cooler listening to a coworker who's just spilling their heart about something going on in their life. Do you see that as an opportunity? Can I share Jesus with this person? That's the way the Apostle Paul thought. As he walked around Athens, he saw all the temples and the idols. He was greatly distressed. I find it interesting that Luke doesn't tell us, the author of the book of Acts, he doesn't say that Paul was really angry. Or he shook his head as he thought about these Athenians. Boy, everyone thinks they're so smart, and yet they worship idols of stone and gold and silver. What a bunch of idiots. He was distressed. His heart went out to them. Is that how you feel about the unbelieving friends that you have who may have made fun of you for being a Christian or coming to a church that is so strict about holding to God's word? Or what about the people who are living openly sinful lives and they are suffering as a result? Their life is a mess and they only have themselves to blame. Do you just shake your head? Wish them luck? Paul gives us another way, doesn't he? Greatly distressed. He did not look down on the Athenians. But neither did he let them off the hook either. He made it clear that the way in which they were living and the things that they believed was ignorance. And it was a sin that needed repenting of. This is perhaps the hardest part of witnessing to someone. It's easy to say God loves you, Jesus died for you. But the person you're speaking to is thinking to himself or herself, so what? Why do I need Jesus? One pastor put it this way, and it's always stayed with me. He says, we need to love our friends, family, and neighbors so much that we say with a genuine tear in our eye, based on what you have said, based on your life, you're not going to heaven. Would it take courage to say something like that? I think more than courage... It takes love. Do I love these individuals enough to share both God's law, which points out sin, as well as what Jesus has done for them? The final thing I think we can take away from the Apostle Paul's experience in Athens is don't think that because you have witnessed that there will always be positive results. When Paul got talking about the resurrection, many of them sneered and they dismissed Paul and they said, "Ah, well, let's listen to him some other time. They're only a handful of people that came to faith and came to Paul to learn more. Have you ever wondered how Mount Calvary Lutheran Church has been around for about 75 years and take a look around you. Why aren't there more people here? There was a time when this congregation was bigger. What's going on? It should not surprise us. In spite of being faithful with the word as individuals, as a congregation, through our school, that not everyone will listen. But that's God's business. It's the Holy Spirit who converts. It's our privilege to take that word and to be faithful in sharing it with the people of our community. 
God is near you. God is revealed through you. I find it interesting that $100, $200 million a year are being spent to find out whether or not there is life out there. When we know that there's eternal life right here, in the word of God, by God's grace, you know this and you believe it. And may God's grace now motivate us to share that message with others. Amen.